I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the countries that we're all joining this session from today. I'm on the lands of the Gadigal people and I pay my respects to elders past and present. Now, acknowledging country um, as we've become accustomed to is a really important way of reminding those of us who are not Indigenous that we're living and working on land that was never ceded by First Nations peoples. It's stolen land we're all benefiting from and I guess with this brings a real privilege and responsibility, I think. Um, and in today's session, we are incredibly fortunate to have Associate Professor Megan Williams um, share with us her reflections and insights into how evaluation can be connected with Indigenous knowledge as for country with a specific focus on practical action um, that I think we can all learn a great deal from. Um, and so Megan and I, in preparing for this session, talked about our real hope that today's session in engaging with Indigenous knowledges and country, that we move beyond those acts of acknowledgement um, that we've become accustomed to, um, to actually a deeper understanding and engagement of all of our roles as people involved in evaluation and in work in this field or interest in this field. Um, while we know that acknowledgement and symbolic um, gestures are critically important, I guess this is a week in which we are or should be reminded that it's absolutely not enough um, to just be having these gestures of acknowledgement. Um, it's Reconciliation Week. Uh, yesterday was Sorry Day, um, the 24th anniversary of the Bringing Them Home report, which um, detailed for the first time on a national scale to a non-Indigenous audience the experience of the stolen generations, the absolutely devastating impact of assimilationist policies that removed um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families and the intergenerational legacy of that. Um, and yet we commemorate that day, but we also still see increasing numbers of Aboriginal children being removed into out-of-home care disproportionately in our youth justice systems. We see grossly disproportionate rates of Aboriginal people being over-policed and incarcerated. Um, you know, institutional racism is everywhere in Australia if you care to look for it. Um, you know, and including in evaluation. And we have a Commonwealth Government Indigenous Evaluation Strategy and Megan is going to engage with that a bit later on um, in this conversation. Um, and, you know, we're absolutely thinking about and engaging with ways to bring more visibility and accountability around evaluation in this area. But today is also the anniversary of the, the 1967 referendum in which Australia voted to include and count Aboriginal people in our national census and also to enable the Commonwealth Government to make laws for Aboriginal people. And certainly, I think those voting at that time didn't feel like that was just a symbolic gesture. They too really wanted to see practical systemic change from that vote. And while we do have had seen um, legislative reform, we now do collect detailed data. We can precisely measure the gap, you know, in life expectancy, in incarceration rates, in education outcomes. You know, do we know enough about whether and how this is actually making a tangible difference in most Aboriginal people's lives? We've had decades of Indigenous policy and programs, you know, and how and where is that achieving intended outcomes? Now, I know this is, these are not unique questions or new ones, in fact, but returning to those questions about how um, evaluation makes a contribution in improving lives and policy and programs, thinking about metrics, metrics of success um, and approaches, methodologies. I think this is really critical work um, for us all to be involved with. And um, I think Megan is such uh, a wonderful voice in this discussion. I uh, will briefly introduce her, because her very impressive bio before actually handing over to her to introduce herself in a way that she might prefer to. But um, it's suffice to say that Megan is an Associate Professor, the Research Lead and Assistant Director of the National Centre for Cultural Competence at the University of Sydney. Megan is Wiradjuri through her father's family. She has over 20 years experience working on programs and research to improve the health and wellbeing of Indigenous people in the criminal justice system. Megan has government and industry funding and collaborations for research, including about health service delivery, workforce development, facilitation of community-driven research and evaluation, Megan is chair of the Justice, Health and Forensic Mental Health Network Human Research Ethics Committee, and we will certainly be covering off um, some of her experiences um, on that ethics committee and her reflections of that particular area later in our conversation. She's a trained Aboriginal Family Wellbeing Program Facilitator. 
She's um, active in research translation. She's conveyed Indigenous people's research stories and expertise to professional bodies, to communities, to parliamentarians, students and in the media. Megan's director of um, and a contributing editor of health media organisation Croaky.org. So those of you who aren't already across that should do so. That's a wonderful um, publication. And also associate editor of Health Sociology Review. Phew. Megan, I know you'd love to be introduced in such detail in that way, um, but I might just pass to you now um, to start, um, you know, introduce yourself in the way that you would like to, but equally to um, perhaps talk a bit to us about your journey into and around evaluation. Mandangu, thanks, Ruth. You're a Dumarung. G'day. I'd yeah, like to acknowledge I'm coming to you from Gadigal land, and I pay my respects to ancestors and spirits of this land and, and the elders of the past who carried forward knowledges of the present that elders of this community are able to pass to visitors like me. And I think of all the deadly young people of the future. And as Wiradjuri, we're definitely encouraged to think of ourselves as belonging to seven generations. And so I know I'm part of four generations um, with us today uh, in this dimension. And uh, yeah, so it's not a stretch to think about the next generations coming forward. So yeah, to like to um, acknowledge country and all that it holds for us. And I'd like to acknowledge just a couple of people I know online. Um, Josie Newton, who I do call my auntie, and um, we've been through, yeah, many projects and struggles together as, um, as Wiradjuri in mainstream systems. Uh, shout out to Amy Dellett and also Quatsip too, big, um, big love for Quatsip. So, yeah, thanks so much, everyone, for joining. It's very humbling. And uh, I know there's many people on the line with more experience than me in evaluation. But I suppose what I can say is that I've tuned in um, to really people like in my family who I uh, think are excluded from health services or don't feel comfortable accessing health services mainstream, often not even Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander community controlled organisations. And so, you know, if you're not sort of participating in health services, you're often not in research either. And then on the other side of the coin, research using administrative data, data linkage research, which is used in evaluation and how that has another way of excluding Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people by, I suppose, assimilating us into the main narrative or, um, or slicing us off to deal with in um, some other special way. So, yeah, sort of been through thick and thin with all, both those um, dimensions. But uh, we've set ourselves a really ambitious topic. Uh, it's deliberate. Uh, Ruth and I have got to keep ourselves amused and we've got to keep ourselves growing and developing and um, stretching. So sort of partly terrified as well as humbled. Um, and so um, one project that I'm involved in is the Centre for Research Excellence in um, Stride and that's strengthening um, systems for Indigenous uh, health equity. And we have pushed ourselves to form the Deadly Poets Society. And um, I'll just claim that I'm a social scientist and I, I'm a writer, I try poetry. Um, and it's been absolutely fantastic to push our thinking. I know that there's all kinds of, um, you know, uh, learning theories about disrupting our thinking and um, Anyway, I just wanted to start with this. It's by Gomeroy poet Alison Whitaker, and she's at Uni of Technology, Sydney. She's also a lawyer. And, um, and this is from her book, um, Black Works, by Black Work 2018 by Magabala Books. Which way Asimov? Uh, I had to Google Asimov, uh, born in Russia and a professor of um, biochemistry um, that lives in the US, which way Asimov? So when you when I read this, just listen for country in it. You start here, ground. Take code from the rivers, grasses. 
where they divert, so shall you assert, so shall you be exponentially. You will live like systems. Feed, die, build, feed, die, build. No need for better, faster, cheaper. No need but what was, what comes next. You end here, fend. Entropic algorithm, take your back against what? Your task to know. So I love that. I could pop um, the text in the chat, um, but again, acknowledging Alison Whitaker, Gomeroy, poet and lawyer. And uh, to me, that it speaks that there, there's code in country and country leads us in all that we need to know. Country pre-exists us, country relies on us and how well we do whatever it is we do. And we're all here because we happen to do evaluation and we are crazy if we do not take country into account in evaluation generally because of climate change, but also in evaluation with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, because we do not exist without our connection to country and our identity and our health and well-being being related to country. So, um, yeah, from my understanding of uh, evaluation, my Western social science training in the very early 1990s, country was not part of um, what we were taught to collect data about. Yeah, so um, lots to talk about. Got to be careful because of time. We do want to cover Indigenous evaluation strategy and some key points on that. And we may have um, Romley Mocat, the commissioner from Productivity Commission online. Um, and if he is, we'll ask him maybe to say a few words as well. And also we do want to cover um, ethics. And um, But mostly I'd like you to leave today with uh, more of a working understanding of NABINYA. It's an evaluation framework that I'd um, developed in the early, from the early 1990s. So I'm just going to do a quick check-in with Ruth. Um, any particular direction to go in now? Well, do you want to jump into Nabinya? Because I think, um, you know, most of the people on this call are members of the Evaluation Society and so we'll have um, subscriptions to the journal and um, would likely have read the article. I know I've had lots of conversations and feedback from other members of the committee and evaluators about how um, valuable and engaging it's been. And I know you've had feedback over the years um, from people as well about how they've learnt from and used that. So it might be incredibly valuable if you could take us through that, um, Meg, and any reflections you've got about the process of developing it and how you've used it in the years since. Okay. Can I just have a show of hands from people who know Stufflebeam? And give us a wave. And do you say chip model or SIP model? Hands up for chip. Mm, SIP. Yeah. Anyway. Um, now, because I belong to that Centre for Research Excellence um, stride, uh, I'm going to absolutely land myself in it right now um, and the Deadly Poet Society, but I'm going to win, um, you know, probably um, some kudos. I have written a poem about how I ended up going from Stuffle Beam's SIP model to Nabinya. And it's called an evaluation poem for an evaluation presentation, probably never to be published. Dear Mr. Stufflebeam, you don't know me, but I've been living with you pretty much daily since 1992. You don't know Dr. Phil Crane either, who introduced me to you, or the excellent evaluation partner, Anna, who also knows you. Phil gave me a dot matrix printout of the SIP model back then, one simple stapled set of pages that became marked all over with my pen. I liked your idea of identifying context for projects, don't get me wrong. I just needed to add country, Mother Earth, the environment, get the landscape into it to whom we all belong. 
I loved listing inputs of projects. Those lists can be long, but in Blackfellow ways, you'd be surprised at the extent of them. Missing what you can't see, surely even from a positivist view, is wrong. Our resources used in projects are incredible. They're not easy to see. And this new list in Nabinya breathes in the spirit of the community. Your use of processes in the SIT model was a bit of a relief. These are the things that can derail a project without processes. How can outcomes be? But Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people work so holistically. Ways of working, again, many people, it seems, devalue or choose not to see. And products in SIT model, well, that's easy to disagree. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are not a capitalist society, never will be. We're very spiritual and philosophical. We know we go backwards to go forwards with lateral thinking and multi-directionality. That has to be seen and acknowledged in processes and learnings to pass them on intergenerationally. But thanks, Mr. Stufflebeam, working on SIP since 1993. I've triple checked and three times over, Nabinya is respectful to you and any copyright ability. It's all food for thought, all to think locally, all for freedom in our beings based on our own specialty. So that's only my second ever love it, man. public <laughs> attempt. <laughs> um, but that is the story of the SIT model, literally walking around with that dot matrix printout and I tore off those side bits that used to get through the printer teeth. Um, and as I worked on um, evaluations in uh, uh, Gold Coast AIDS and Injectors Newsline, Youth and Family Services in Logan, Brisbane Youth Service in Brisbane, uh, uh, returning home, it wasn't until the returning home evaluation of three post-prison release services um, with Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander organisations that I gave Nabinya a name and put it um, in the, in the report to those evaluations. And a uh, shout out to my colleague, Il Sablino, who some of you will know, very experienced in evaluation, um, really encouraged me to um, submit it to the journal. And so since then, it's been one of the um, most downloaded for that year and that edition. And Nabinya has been used among um, Indigenous um, cocoa growers, in uh, local health district, in child services and a number of other places. And, and it's great now these days to be able to see where. So I wondered about um, taking, I could show you on the screen um, uh, the steps really in Nabinya. And then- You're gonna be great, Meg, the yeah. Prompts. Yeah, so I'm gonna share my screen. And just bear with me while I get it. Okay, are you seeing how to use Nabinya? Yes, we are. Excellent. Okay, so form an evaluation reference group. It uh, sounds surprisingly simple, but it's surprisingly left off. Uh, or a lot. And um, if that was me, it would be led by and chaired by Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander um, community leaders relevant to that project or program context and community context. And I'm used to working with, um, oh, with people of all cultures, not only all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on those reference groups, um, but people of all cultures, uh, because I've been taught just need to have the right people in the right place at the right time. And, um, and we know that we all share resources and all have varying roles. But that is really critical. You could call it a working group. You could, I often call it a team and really develop that um, shared ownership of our process. It's ideal if that happens well before a need for evaluation is identified. But I've had the experience in the last couple of days where there's um, a large evaluation already funded of a state government program and they've um, 
only just realised now Aboriginal people are overrepresented. They haven't designed the evaluation to, um, to use, address, deal with or engage with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people or issues in any way. And so now they are in um, the position of thinking they need uh, to form an Aboriginal reference group. And they're really only doing that because they know they can't get through ethics without it. So that's a hideously devaluing but very common um, experience. So if you know that there's that need for evaluation, ensure that first peoples are first and design evaluation because if you get it right for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, you're more likely to get it right for anyone who's experiencing complex and compounding issues and you'll get a great creative um, evaluation design anyway. So together, go through the prompts in the nub in your paper and identify the ones that are relevant. So I'll go through some of these with you um, after going through this list, but just to give you the global picture. So format reference group, together sit down and go through the prompts. You'll soon work out which ones apply, which ones don't, and you'll get ideas on which other ones um, suit that local context. These prompts are essentially to identify data from an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander local perspective. And that data is needed to answer research questions. So then think about ethics clearance if that's needed, collect and clean your data. The group goes back through the prompts and asks itself, does the data answer those questions? And through doing that, uh, that's analysis happening and interpretation by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and that triggers how reporting needs to occur. And all of this can be written up according to the nub in your prompts or a thematic analysis arising from that uh, data or by program logic as well. So nub in your, it means to, ref to do something, reflect on it and refine and keep doing it in my understanding in Wiradjuri language and uh, so that's the same with using the prompts you don't just use them at the beginning and then never return back to them they're, they're excellent to go back to to ascertain if we're on track when it comes to reporting on um, according to the questions so it's a framework so it's not going to do the evaluation it's not going to um, change how you might write necessarily, right? You still will write your research questions or you might have your aim, objectives and strategies and program logic can be applied to this. So it doesn't necessarily have to change any of the ways you all might be used to doing evaluation. It's the set of prompts that are informed by Aboriginal holistic definition of health, as well as the um, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and also other current government strategies in this Australian context so that we've got those kind of parameters in there. And then also say by Wiradjuri knowledge systems, are uh, called Norm Sheehan in particular, and also um, other Indigenous scholars, as well as the National Health and Medical Research Council's um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Health Research Guidelines. So I've drawn on all of those as well as Stuffle Beam's prompt, um, SIP model prompts, as well as my experience in evaluation to come up with these um, sets of prompts. So uh, I'm a pretty average poet. I'm really much worse as an artist and this is the best I can do. And, um, but you can see there the landscape, that bigger, um, picture, part of the picture. And then there's all these resources that we put in. There's all these different ways of working and all the learning. So the inputs in the SIP model are resources. The um, processes are those ways of working and the products are these learnings. And at the middle, you can do that thematic analysis and come up with critical success factors about what's working in a program if you want to do that. So... Um, so as I said, it's a framework, it fits with program logic. You'll be triggered to think about quant and qual data. And um, it can be used concurrent to 
our program delivery, concurrent evaluation, it can be used to reflect back on our program or project, and it can be used as a planning tool as well. So there's the, those landscape prompts uh, from an Aboriginal perspective, they really honour that the history of local community affects so much that happens. And I'm, I'm about to go um, work in an Aboriginal community, a large town that I haven't worked in or been among or even visited for 25 years. And their history is so different to that of Wiradjuri country that the first thing I've done is try to read up and remember how, how, what happened to those people. You know, they had at least 16 tribes um, swept together into a mission by a church and that church pulled out and left that community bereft. So that history is really different to northeast Wiradjuri country where I'm from, where there were massacres and poisonings and only really children um, remained of my family and they only really survived because of institutionalisation. So we have to ask questions sensitively about the history of local community. It really is integrally linked with lo local population indicators, which we need data on. We need data on um, the current published stats about the issue in that location. It might sound like a no brainer and all of these probably sound really obvious, but in my experience with evaluation design and certainly with reviewing um, countless funding and research applications, it's surprising how these things are left off. Uh, so landscape prompts us to think about all the other services available in an area and their range and their accessibility. Some of those mainstream services have a major influence on how Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander services can do business and on funding, on um, confidence of the board, you name it. So we have to get data on um, though these are the contextual factors for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander services. Same with needs. It may again sound like a no brainer, but it is surprising how often we don't really ask that local community, what are their needs? The, all the range of their needs as well. We've got to go looking for how we see human rights instruments being used and at play in those local areas. Again, surprising how um, they never roll off the tongue of, um, you know, government officials or other community leaders. There's always legislation that affects how things are done. And in my field, which is specifically prison health, Medicare is a major issue. And we're constantly trying to think about legislative reform so that people in prison might have access to health services equivalent to in the community to which they have a right. Policy, you, we've got to look at what shifts and critiques have occurred. So that's sort of an overview. Then in the Nabinya, you can see here how there's many more prompts with all of that detail. So I have this in a Word document, which I'm happy to send around. Um, and so I'll have one column with these prompts and then two more columns, an empty column, where as we talk about it in the reference group, and get ideas like what is the history of the local area? Uh, how can we get data about those items? And then we'll have that, um, that in a, another column. So we start to get um, those ideas on how, how and where to get data from. And that helps, of course, identify what gaps there are. So here's um, some prompts. So partly these are here so that, um, you know, we don't have to keep recreating and um, these lists and doing this thinking every time. I found that I did um, pretty consistently want to ask and answer these types of questions across my experience in evaluation in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander context. And um, so they're reasonably all encompassing but you just discard or cr cross out the ones that don't apply. And as I said before, you'll be triggered to think about which ones do apply. 
So history of the local area, the history of program establishment, wow, that influences how a program's able to meet, um, mm. achieve anything. And same with, um, as I said before, colonisation, dispossession. In terms of the environment, lo- so that, that is local population characteristics, socioeconomic factors, Sim- differences and similarities, pretty interesting in the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people compared to others in the local area. That data can be really telling, but it's not very easily available. But if you put it on your list to go looking for it, you'll get a much better picture about what's going on and what's possible. Same with this, it's often overlooked proximity to and accessibility of major health and social services, barriers and enablers. So there's a few handy hints there. You can have a look at local health districts, say, in New South Wales, completion rates of respecting the difference um, online training compared to face-to-face, face-to-face training. The online's mandatory, face-to-face is optional. And you can, you wonder when you see lower levels of the face-to-face completions in some local health districts, what their workforce might be like compared to a district with high levels of that. So we start to get a sense of, you know, we probably should be looking for um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander staff workforce numbers and retention, racism um, and other signifiers of exclusion. So you can see there's lots of detail in these prompts and same um, with all of these. So I won't go through them all, but there's a bunch of prompts to get us thinking. We, uh, when we come to evaluate a program or a project, we do need to think about the impact of other programs and services on it. And here's, um, and also the way the program or service is structured. So here's some prompts about that, um, some hints from Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander way um, about what to go looking for. That's really easy to overlook unless you've kind of been in among it. If you've been in among Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander service providers, as I said, you'll be stimulated to think, oh, in our context, this particular thing applies and we'll find some data about that. So I am in no way trying to be comprehensive um, here, but really stimulate um, people's thinking. So self-determination, if if there's, if it's ever mentioned in that program or um, project you're evaluating, you have to think about um, getting Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people's evidence. And here's a couple of prompts. Same with policy, you know, really looking at the quality of policy from an Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander perspective. So I'll just do a quick check in with Ruth. Shall I? <laughs> Carry on, Meg. It's all great. One of the Keep things I'm, I'm hoping that you'll also get to is um, we've talked before about the role of what you've referred to as cultural care and healing. Um, and it, I mean, I don't want to interrupt your flow because I think this next slide will be of particular interest to a lot of people, but it would be great if we could also return to that because there's some really important conceptual work there, which I think is really valuable if okay, we got time. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. Um, great. So here's um, prompts about the resources. And so stuff will be called these um, inputs. So resources are a little bit more friendlier and um, and really important overall to think about um, funded and non-funded cash and in-kind. And um, my passion is about peer support. So this is also about looking at um, informal caregiving, for example. So all the resources put in the program, oh, time after time, we see so much that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders give all their knowledges, all their yarns. We've got to somehow capture that as a type of evidence um, because it influences programs and it influences evaluations as well. There's, yes, the financial, there's always the formal funding and other contributions. Let's look at people power, paid, unpaid, the role of the community. And I'm passionate as well about the multiple hats too. And can we do a multiplier? You know, when I go to the um, prison, you know, sometimes I'll go in one door as a visitor and I'll stay and I'll go in another door as a professional. And 
you know, that just wearing the multiple hats and the richness of my understanding of that particular centre, how I carry myself there, my confidence there, because I am not just as a professional, it's personal as well. I think that there's um, magic, there's something brought, um, it's very um, mature often of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who can juggle the multiple roles. Uh, stakeholders love to do a bit of stakeholder mapping and data um, in the old records, there's always plans that can be um, accessed so you can help identify um, resources, equipment and evidence. Theory is another resource too, explicit and implicit. And, um, you know, I love to see even um, about coercive control, an article that uh, Chelsea Bond has out and Amy Maguire, we know her, a, a Durrumbull woman, we know her as a journalist, but she's a theorist. And so um, I can only but imagine the type of intellectual resourcing she has done to projects that she's um, delivered. So I'm aware too, it's a roundabout now, I probably seem like a pie in the sky idealist and we're gonna drown in data. But that's why you have an evaluation reference group so that you've got some accountability and you'll have some reality checker people um, on that and you need the ideas people like me so that power in collaboration so here's some um, prompts about financial resources consider the adequacy of financial resources to meet the demand for services and support and the needs to support Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander workforce development to support program monitoring and evaluation and participation in research. Often we'll do the program delivery and not the evaluation. And also what about the knowledge transfer that needs to happen after, you know, often we'll get to the end of evaluation and collapse and uh, that's a major problem. Human resources, I've talked a bit about that, but here's um, some more detailed prompts and, um, and then material resources as well. And um, yeah, this sort of phrasing here about meeting need and future growth. And I think those two dimensions are really important because we, you know, about a third of our Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander population is under 21. And so when, when we think about Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people, we really need to think about them in our minds as primary school and early high school as a population. We're not an ageing population, obviously. We're very young. So when we think about that majority of our population, we've got to be pushing evaluation to answer questions well into the future for us, not just answering questions now. So it's a kind of very surprisingly different way that we would need to do things from Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander evaluation perspective. Only I suspect we probably need to do that with any population. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, we do hear a lot of people talking about evaluation needing to be data driven, but there's a nuance to what you're saying there, which is there's demographic information that's relevant for us to think about, but we have to bring that in in meaningful ways in terms yeah. of what that the reality of um, people's lives but as you say planning for um, that age bracket and thinking about having those voices also included perhaps in yeah that evaluation think, work that's right that and aboriginal perspective i think you know leads me to, to know how rare evaluation is and how we really need it to work for us mm. um, to pitch forward so here's ways of working prompts um, you know the Big long list there, holistic advocacy, take into account our diversity. And then here's all the nuance prompts about, you know, that holistic um, caregiving. It's beyond the individual. That's probably one of the biggest challenges to evaluation is how to not pathologise that individual. The family is our unit of intervention. What tools do we have to collect data from family perspective? You know, that's very few. Quality caregiving is what we're after, and that's really hard to assess as well. Uh, but here's some prompts that hopefully help signify that um, from the Aboriginal way of working. And um, staff support uh, can just never underestimate the power that 
the 97% have the non-Indigenous workforce and the power that, that they have um, um, in programs, in government and um, funding, procurement, you name it. And um, I think underscoring all of this is that relative powerlessness that Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people often experience, um, certainly in research and evaluation. Learning, so yes, it's outputs, reflections, critiques, relationships, progress. How can we just measure progress? Um, the, yes, the results of act, um, activities, the extent to which principles are implemented, barriers, enablers, all really valuable information for the future, not just whether this project met its um, aims. So here's and lots of... Just... Can I just briefly ask you about the principles point? Because I think that's a really important one. It's a bit like theory. People kind of say, oh, yeah, that's all very well, but but how do you actually apply that in principle in an evaluation? And I'm interested in any reflections you might have about um, measuring the implementation or the manifestation of a principle or series of principles in work you've been involved with. Not to take you away from the slideshow, but I just... <laughs> no, that's on that fine. Point, if there's yeah. an example that you can think of easily that. Yeah, um, two. One, one is to do interviews and collect that um, the nuance qualitatively. Mm. Um, but another is, uh, is a matrix and like, um, like a scale if you need to do that among large population and, um, and judge people's um, perception of the extent to which it, you, you witness that. Uh, or experience that principle in action. So it can be quant and it can be as simple as that type of, um, say, participant or stakeholder feedback. Um, but there's nothing like eldership and their um, deep reflection on principle as well. And if there is a knowledge hierarchy, I would kind of privilege elder insights very much. Yeah, definitely. So then, oh, yeah, that's thanks, my yeah. Little insights, I suppose. Lots about learnings. So I won't, um, you know, really go too much more into those, um, except say when you do, um, as a group, decide on data and then you've gathered that data, hopefully Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people are involved in that and involved in that whole process of cleaning it really important as well that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are involved in um, designing the analysis, what, you know, what's going to get run if it's quant or how it's going to get analysed as quell as well. And then that next step about interpretation, the so what factor. It's really, I, I hope I'm not, um, you know, belittling by saying that, but it is surprising how it's not resourced I suppose we might want to do that and respect that process but resourcing it is a different story so that means sitting fees terms of reference good facilitation safety group safety and reflection on group safety and debriefing as well I've led a group of people through um I, we've worked with some of the most horrendous data that I, I could ever want to expose people to about um, impacts of parental incarceration and, um, and in the context of program evaluation. And, um, uh, yeah, we, we needed very careful facilitation with that. So you have to have a skilled person then who needs to be paid to do that. So... Now is probably too when it starts to all sound too hard because it's too expensive. But if we want what we've always had, we'll do what we've always done. Or if we are a country that wants something better for our own identity as Australian people, we'll do evaluation better and we'll fund it better too. So I think that's um, about it for me in terms of that. Thanks, yeah. Anna. And, um, and your, you know, the article, we've put the details in the chat too of which journal that came from, but there is a lot more detail in that. But it's it's always um, really useful to, to have the author kind of talk through their thinking around it all. And certainly on our New South Wales committee, we've talked a lot about um, 
bringing to life some of those articles in the journal and actually bringing in um, some some discussion of them too. So it's really it's really valuable and really appreciate your kind of reflections around all of that. And I know you've said, um, you know, at times people have kind of said that this seems a bit boutique, um, but I'm really um, reminded and struck by the point you were making about actually if we design things well for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the likelihood is actually this is going to be a much more meaningful framework and response for everyone. Um, but, I'm, you know, I really feel like that idea of something being boutique is um, a way of trying to dismiss it perhaps uh, or not engage with it comprehensively. But there's nothing in what you were saying that, um, you know, as you said, this might sound like common sense, but it's there's so much of evaluation that's done so poorly, actually setting out a comprehensive framework like this with these prompts is a really useful guide. Um, and I, I feel like there'll be a huge amount for everyone to learn from that, having heard you talk through that. Yeah, thanks. It It is really thorough. So that's one thing when you're doing evaluation is you, you know, do want to feel like we've given it our best to be thorough. Um, and I still use it in the way anyone else would use it, like sit down with the tables, fill them out, go through it all mm. and, and go back to it to help um, understand it all. And every time I think, oh, wow, this is such a lot of work. <laughs> and I think, who designed this? Well, and then I think um, I'm glad it's comprehensive and I feel yeah. more confident because it is. That's and, it. Um, yeah. And there's a way that the prompts all lead to the next prompt. So, um, and you can just divide up the use of it into, say, four pockets of time, one domain at a time over four meetings if you need as well. So That's fantastic. Megan, can I ask you um, to talk a little bit about the, the new Commonwealth Government Indigenous Evaluation Strategy? Um, and I know that this is something that um, the AES has been really engaged with and supportive of. Um, and I know you mentioned, I know Romley Mokak actually um, registered. I'm not sure if he's been able to make it, but um, it, it's really interesting, I suppose. I mean, it's wonderful to have an Indigenous Policy Evaluation Commissioner. That's an extraordinary kind of step and obviously its development um, and release has been a significant development federally um, but really interested in any reflections you might have about um, its development, its role, um, the procurement strategy I suppose that um, by the um, National Indigenous Agency and just anything that you've seen around its, its use and relevance um, in evaluation more generally. Yeah, thanks, Ruth. It um, was a fairly short process when you look at the time frame here, um, a, a little over a year and a half, I suppose, from when the letter came, issues paper was released, um, submissions were due, and, um, and when the final strategy was released to government. Um, but I do urge people to have a look at the, um, you know, 200 or so submissions. There's many quotable quotes in those submissions. Um, if you ever need leverage in funding application or anything, it is a good resource. Um, but there's this quite an interesting progression paper that's come out of it. And um, I've just popped it in a little table. So for these um, um, central ideas, like centering Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, perspectives, priorities, and knowledges, building credible evaluation practices, improving evaluation usefulness, building ethical evaluation practices, improving evaluation transparency. In this the, um, strategy progression pathway document, each one of these is um, documented according to what unsatisfactory practice looks like in centering Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people, perspectives, priorities. And what does developing practice look like? What does mature practice look like? What does leading practice look like? So it is a way that um, we can assess. We'll all be different and we'll all be different for different projects and different um, groups, but it's um, really important critical reflection um, that we can do there. It is also a way of calling out um, unsatisfactory practice and it's a way of um, positioning and pitching to, you know, people higher up in funding bodies as so it's pretty useful. Uh, so the procurement strategy do, of the NIAA do, does ask people, applicants, to um, demonstrate how they 
do use Indigenous evaluation methodologies, um, how they draw on the Indigenous evaluation strategy. Nabinya is mentioned actually as one of the methodologies. It's in brackets, how you, you know, Indigenous methodologies with a um, name in brackets and Nabinya is included in there. So that is, um, yeah, astounding to see. It's astounding that it's 2021 decades of funding that um, obviously hasn't been evaluated and um, and the, the great risks that have come from that. So yeah. it's setting a high bar and um, really calling all of the Australian governments a whole of government framework, another lever we can use. Government have committed yeah. to that on paper. Let's watch and call it out. But Australian government agencies that's astounding and it's for selecting planning conducting and using policies and programs so it's very high bar and um, what we don't have are Meg I think we might have just lost you briefly there there are others having the same issue it's a yeah I wonder, Meg, if you turn off your camera briefly, whether that might help, just so we can still hear you sure. at least. It's that time of day where the NBN gets weary. Is getting busy in this neighborhood as well. So that's yeah. a little snapshot of that um, Indigenous evaluation strategy. And yeah, probably several people on here have um, made submissions or used elements of it, um, but it is there to use and we must go to it each and every time we're thinking about um, evaluation or research. I think it's really valuable and, um, you know, it's a really fantastic development at a national level. Um, and I think rather than people viewing it as something that doesn't necessarily apply to them if they're not directly involved in Commonwealth government evaluation, um, yeah. using it as a, as a guide is incredibly useful and embedding it in practice. Um, Megan, we've got a fantastic question in the chat here, which I wonder if we might be able to go to next. Yeah. Um, Someone asking, how do you cost yeah, up the I value so. of Abri Aboriginal? Oh, you can see it. How do you cost up the value of Aboriginal and Torres Strait yeah. Islander knowledge and contributions to gain a true insight of program costs, such as lived experience and community connections that are inherently brought to service or program delivery? How to value this in evaluation to aim for more sufficient future funding models? Yeah, excellent. Um, well, I'll, I've got a quote here by Bill Jonas um, and oh, Marsha Langton and IATSA yeah. staff, yeah, uh, from 1994, from that early edition of the little red, yellow and black and green and blue and white book. And if you don't have a new edition of that, I might um, put my camera back on. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, you're fine now, we can hear you. Yeah, so do get the recent copy of that. Get copies for others in your work area as well. And the quote um, from this, since 1788, the newcomers to our country have often assumed that Indigenous peoples, cultures and societies were worthless because of their efforts to understand us were too superficial. The impressions they gained were those of tourists passing through, not those of neighbours. As Australians, we begin to see themselves, as Australians begin to see themselves as part of the Asia and Pacific regions, rather than as a satellite suburb of Europe, they are also seeing the first Australians through new eyes. So that to me speaks about value because of the word worthless valueless and so that question from Quatsip um, obviously evaluation has the word value in it so it is a um, really important question um, uh, 
the answer for me is to do that with your local evaluation reference group and oh, ask oh. them to set that price. What price? Whether it's, um, you know, scratching together actually what wages people use, uh, people earn, and estimating what well, elders are a bit like a professor. They, you know, a professor gets this much per hour. Would you value your input at this much per hour? Oh, no, 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 half that. Like you can actually have those discussions and come up with an agreed local figure. There's also the government figures for participating in committees. Um, and so they are good leverage to use as well. Um, for costing that, but I think absolutely be bold and um, and do try to get an agreed figure. The safety is in the agreement. So the proper process has to be used and the right people you know, to, to manage that process to get that figure and um, if, if it's an actual figure because absolutely unless we do cost that out, then it's invisible and we will really not make yeah, and I think, Megan, I'm just looking back to the slide from Nabinia, your framework, where you have those list of resources. And, you know, it would be, I mean, you may well have already done this or others have, but to actually work, even working with a good economist, um, not an evil economist, <laughs> a yeah. uh, economist who could sit, you know, actually do some of that really comprehensive work um, around thinking and not reducing everything to a dollar figure because we also know that there's... Um, you know, there's kind of traps in that too, in reducing um, things to a kind of economic argument. But we do know the pragmatics in which policy decisions are made and resources yeah, exactly. are allocated. Yeah. I did enroll in um, a postgraduate economics degree recently. Nothing the, like another degree. The textbook's just there. New Australasian macroeconomic theory. And I thought, oh, great. It'll definitely have Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people so you know go to the contents list there's no chapter oh maybe they've used indigenous I'll go to the you know index no no um so yeah I did of course being a nerdy mature age student asked the lecturer how come and they said that oh there's no one like no one's written it and well do you want to write it I'm like <laughs> I've got to pass the macroeconomics maths first. But, you know, that's um, that invisibility is, oh, it's so painful. And why, what, like how hard it is to try to get through a book like that and to not be included, to be so disregarded, all the economies that have flourished here. Imagine a creative chapter in there to bring macroeconomic theory to life in you know, right across this Asia Pacific area and um, as well. So, um, yeah, finding an economist um, is, yeah, <laughs> another uh, very hard issue. So, yeah, we, you know, a lot of this really, because like I said before, our population's so young, you know, we really ought to be thinking and, and the the society could be thinking about how do we plan for curriculum that is going to have a process for young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to see research and evaluation as a career, to want to do something like economics. If any of us here have responsibility for curriculum, for student recruitment, we've got to start thinking what is in our domain uh, sphere of influence for us to change or we won't see an increase um, in researchers and, and in my time being trained in um, the early 90s I only got sent because I was terrible at health promotion going to Gold Coast nightclubs with an <laughs> eight foot condo man and a basket of safe sex things I hated it um, but I was lucky enough to um, be trained with um, Indigenous peoples from all over South Pacific and that was a three-week um, what we'd probably call micro-credentialing now. Mm. It's just one of those rare random projects that um, that a, a university offered and that we've, we've got an alumni from that and, um, you know, how can we start thinking about sharing, uh, you know, maybe a cross-institutional arrangement where we do have um, those smaller degrees so that we can 
build that workforce of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander evaluators. We are coached to think by our elders that Aboriginal people were the first researchers and the first evaluators. And we've got this one sort of word that encompasses something so holistic and powerful. Um, so it's um, just trying to push ourselves in our roles now to not just do evaluation, but to grow the sector for the next sort of three to four generations ahead of us. It is something that we um, need to make a plan for, I think, as a sector. And I think that's something that all of us involved in evaluation and certainly the AES and the various committees should be turning their heads to. I mean, I think that's on all of us to think about um, that, um, you know, enabling, supporting, equipping work and, and mentoring, and it can come in many sorts of forms. So it's certainly a role, I think, for the Evaluation Society and for those of us involved in the various committees and in this sector too. Yeah. Um, just briefly, Megan, we had Ken from ARTD has um, just made a note in the chat that ARTD recently set up an Aboriginal reference group to oversee an evaluation of housing um, products or projects, I guess, and we use the New South Wales Government's Public Service Commission's Guide to Aboriginal Protocols to help determine remunerations. Yeah, that's great. I um, do turn to that New South Wales Government Public Service Commission for um, uh, regularly for workforce data and also their workforce plan ahead. Um, so really valuable resource. Great mention there, Ken, ARTD. <laughs> Got another very important reflection in the chat, Megan. Um, someone who inherited the condo man costume from you. No, you work oh, very well yeah. in that space. Thanking <laughs> you for growing that. a peer evaluation effort. Oh yes, we did too. We did pyramid selling. What a legacy! Actually, it was so good. Um, yeah, worked really well. We did get in trouble by the health department at one point, but it was fine. Yes. Now, Megan, can we, in the time we've got left, um, just perhaps turn to ethics, because I know this is one you and I both feel really strongly about, and it's not just because we're also academic researchers. Um, it's, you know, the really important role that ethics plays in accountability, in reflection, in um, reporting and being accountable to community and other partners and doing things properly, as you've kind of outlined. Um, so talk to us about what why evaluators should have ethics approval. Give us some of your worst examples to demonstrate that and just why it's important and useful to embrace ethics as part of evaluation. Yeah, sure. Well, I have to start with another poem, um, Shame by Kevin Gilbert. Some say shame when we're talking up and, and shame for the way we are and shame because we ain't got a big flash house or a steady job in a car. Some call it shame when our kids, they die from colds or from sheer neglect. Shame when we live on the riverbanks while collecting our welfare checks. Shame when we're blind from trachoma. Shame when we're crippled from blights. But I reckon the worstest shame is yours when you deny us human rights. And those ethics guidelines aren't human rights as such, but uh, being on a human research ethics committee, you know, it is a um, it is a proper place. They are ethics guidelines that people have to adhere to. And I suppose what I've seen is every trick in the book that people try to get around. Um, first on the human research ethics application online, if you do click yes, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people are going to be participants in this, then the... Um, there's a whole heap of other drop down um, fold out boxes that have to get answered about how and when and what resourcing and um, and and it's very common that projects are planned without um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in them at the beginning. And so for someone to just tick no there and hope that the ethics committee won't notice um, and probably people hope that they won't notice <clears throat> because there aren't, um, you know, that many Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander researchers. So maybe there's an assumption there's not that many Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people trained on ethics committees to help with this accountability. So that really it's hurt so bad um, when we are kind of that you see that initial assumption. Um, and then that's if uh, an evaluation project 
um, you know, an ethics application is put in for an evaluation project. Um, so there's, yeah, one, one quite recently. Well, I'll, actually, I'll start with a great experience, um, an evaluation I'm involved in with uh, two or three government organisations and um, a consortium of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander community controlled organisations. Um, we've got three layers of governance with Aboriginal leadership at each layer. And, um, and so, of course, we were really confident in our evaluation design and it's um, intervention research and evaluation. So it's a uh, really great use of research funding. And we um, didn't have any issues getting through ethics clearance. So the point is, while people think that it's going to take them longer to have Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people in that design and the setup, you can get through ethics easier, like quicker, when all of those elements are in the right place. And again, it sounds like a no brainer, but it is so surprising how often that doesn't happen. And we, we've had, you know, in the field I work in, um, inexperienced people designing programs that are, you know, about extremely sensitive issues among people with many is issues, mental health, suicide risk, suicide um, attempts, poverty and um, trauma, and to not have Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people um, involved in the design of that evaluation. Uh, you know, it really presents a risk of, of death. And, you know, for people in prison, just experience major long, long lockdowns to prevent the spread of COVID, to then have to participate because there's all, always also that one project, you couldn't quite tell the difference between the um, service delivery and the evaluation. And implicit in it was that because you're a, participant in the program, you're a participant in the evaluation and that not being made clear. It's unethical mm. too and it risks people's well-being. So, yeah, so that was a pretty dirty, uh, dirty one. And I'm just mindful of once again in that process, Megan, I mean, it's fantastic that you and others are sitting on those committees, but that's an enormous amount of your time and energy that's um, then taken up with having to call individual researchers and evaluators to account. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's really time consuming. And also, you know, I, I've had to do a lot of work on my own self too. It's, I don't come, um, well, just the risk of over-disclosing, you know, chronic people pleaser and um, insecure, got all my own insecurities. And so my need to make sure when I provide a response, it's a squeaky clean pal palpable response that'll stack up. So I'll be quoting the national statement and these guidelines and that one. And, and that's the enormous amount of work as well, me dealing with me in the, mm. in the midst of that and not the confident um, voice I might have if I had a much straighter identity as a, you know, non-Indigenous educated person, me being English on mum's side, black on dad's side, and having education. And um, it's I'm full of shame too. So it's also dealing with those um, elements of ourselves. I don't have that many um, peers and mentors. You know, I cling to people like you, Ruth, because of um, knowing that you've done the work as well so uh it's also yeah i guess the call out to be a great um support person and ally to aboriginal Torres Strait islander um evaluators and researchers and and really supporting those who show an interest because um uh because aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people in my experience are just such sharp thinkers with a very honed radar for principles and um never forget <laughs> when things don't go well either and um, always remember and celebrate. So a real um, uh, repository of knowledge too. Yeah. Uh, so 
Yeah, I was going to say, Meg, I mean, we don't have um, any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on our South Wales committee. And as you're talking, I'm thinking that's um, that's incredibly telling and an indictment on us and as a committee, something that we really need to shift and work around and also think in more systemic ways how we as a committee and as a discipline um, seek to address some of those issues. So thank you for your generosity and vulnerability in raising that. And I do feel like we need to take up challenge um yeah some, one ex, yeah oh one suggestion i've got there you know because a lot of yeah. us um at unis and in these roles are pretty overloaded but if there's ways of having young people involved mm. too um and because i still i find young people can be very outspoken um again with that honed radar about principles and um and I have found and others have said Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people can be very loyal and um, will stay over the long term when there's a uh, vision for uh, the role that they might fulfil and that safety and good treatment too. So while, um, you know, there may be people who might not have the academic qualifications mm. or the experience, um, when we boil it down to core things that underpin evaluation like principles, then we see the similarities in how and what people can contribute looking beyond qualifications mm. or, um, or roles, but to some of the core skills. Yeah, thanks, Megan. That's really valuable. And I think it's something for us as a committee. And on that, um, Flo from the New South Wales Committee has added in the chat the link to our Mentimeter, which is the committee's way of getting feedback from people. And we know that this is the time of day where people start to peel off and cook dinners and um, comfort disgruntled children and pets and things. But yeah. um, for all of you, and certainly, Megan, I've been making lots of notes of you've been talking to bring back to the committee, but for all of you here, and of course, you too, Megan, any feedback um, you can provide through the Mentimeter is really valuable to us. So just as a note before you peel sure. off, if people could do that, that's really valuable. But I'm also taking notes on what you're saying, Meg, so I don't feel like you've got to do that no. as well as actually this whole <laughs> um, talk. But there is a fantastic um, message someone sent me through on ethics, and I would love to put this to you, Meg. We're running out okay. of time, but this is a really gold one. Um, someone's saying, with ethics committees, there are current processes and mechanisms that do work, but there's also ones that go against self-determination. There are a lot of non-Indigenous evaluation agencies doing evaluations in Indigenous settings. And from my experience, ethics has been a reason they use for not sharing data, community data in particular, with community organisations. And so that information or data is never owned or shared or accessible with community or providers that directly work with them. How do we work through this? Any insights? Yeah, and my working understanding of the national statement, NHMRCs um, I, and other guidelines, I think we would find that um, it's unethical to not um, have that data sovereignty vested in the community. And it actually is up to an ethics committee to be skilled enough to um, request information about how that um, is realised. So... Yeah, um, and I think if we go back to your point about those of us who um, would seek to make non-Aboriginal people, non-Indigenous people who make a contribution, how to be reasonable allies and actually just ethical professionals in our areas, actually listening more and learning more from that work that's already been done and thinking about actually embedding that in, in our practices constantly and having that as a, a framework and a reference. And I think evaluations are good at reflection often and we should embed that um, more as a discipline in, and you know create room for that to do collectively and also calling each other out and embedding accountability in that work where you see poor practice it's terrible for all evaluators actually where you see people taking shortcuts and being unethical and and actually deepening um, institutional racism rather than challenging it yeah that other question that's in the chat about um you know, uh, Linda Klein, I mentioned differences between Aboriginal countries and what um, what do I suggest we suggest? When a project spans many different Aboriginal countries, like across New South Wales and ACT, but the reference group consists of only like six to eight self-nominated Aboriginal people representing a sample of those countries, 
is this an issue? And it is an issue. It's both an issue in what it produces and does, but it's also an issue in what we, um, um, how do we avoid that? It's only avoidable if we've got funding allocated for um, payment of somebody to coordinate Aboriginal Torres Strait Island people's input and payment for people to, um, for their time. And not all Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people require funding to be, payment to be at a meeting, especially if they're waged and they can be part of that as a job. But there's a lot of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people with our uh, one RDO I've worked closely with. Um, you know, she's got a bachelor and a postgrad degree, but she didn't work in that sector. She's absolutely uh, razor sharp when it comes to understanding our topics. So she, there's I, people like her that um, and universities and government departments do not have easy ways. We can fund her. She'll have to get on the on the HR system and all those logins and contracts and that that puts an end to. You know what, like the issue Linda's pointing out, those six to eight self nominated, they're probably people who can work their way around either not being paid or they can manage how to be paid. And um, if we just had more streamlined administration processes and funding to help for somebody to help do this work, we will get people from all over who want to participate. If we set the project up well, mm. there's Aboriginal people who can facilitate group safety. And we respect Aboriginal people and we really show the value of their input. We will get people, but we won't get people if we don't have the right way to pay and the time frame issues and all mm. that. This is where the actual administration of research needs to change a bit as well. We keep trying to think of the same way that we do research business and Aboriginal people are going to come stick to it. But we, if we can somehow loosen and and reformulate a process of research or evaluation um, then we'll be able to get a lot of input to and young people that's again I'm passionate about young getting young people involved so that um quiver and that condo man back to that old work we really did do pyramid selling it was a community-based mm. organization you um you got paid a hundred dollars for every um, survey that you got completed mm. but they could go to places we could not go as service providers and get the data and yes we did get um, criticized yeah but they could have just gone and made up and filled out all the surveys themselves but I don't think they did they were involved in designing the survey mm. they were involved in setting the targets of how many we needed and in the process of analysing the data. They didn't want dodgy data made up. They wanted also the pride they had in that data that we were collecting. So and that's, that's yeah. a critical point to, isn't it, Megan, that we're talking about reference reference group or reference board, but actually what you're describing in the integrity of that process is actually having Aboriginal people involved from the outset and from the beginning in the program design and the methodology, <gasps> in all of that work. Hello to the Beagle. Um, but I, I think it's um, that's really critical, isn't it? That that's what we're moving towards. That it's not just about advice, or it's actually about Aboriginal people, you know, undergoing and leading and being investigators in that work. Yeah, and so that work is about partnerships, and it's the same for me. You know, when I moved from Brisbane to Sydney, starting again and asking who are the elders here, where do I fit in, what you know, how do I be a good partner, and what have I got to offer and slowly, slowly building those relationships. And, um, and so um, we, we, like, let's do that work because we um, ap appreciate and respect that work rather than because, oh, now we have to squeeze a project through an ethics um, committee. Yeah. It's an insult. Absolutely. Um, we've got, just before we wrap up, Megan, we've got a quick clarifying question in the chat about um, asking you the national statement in ethics. What was that that you referred to? Just if you could um, re-reference that. Yeah, sure. That's the National Health and Medical Research Council's national statement um, on ethics, uh, on research 
human research ethics. And so I'm used to that because I'm from health. So um, that's why I always go to that one. And that, that NHMRC has got its Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research guidelines. And so say for the ethics committee I chair and I'm a part of, um, it is our responsibility for all applicants to meet all items in the national statement that apply to their projects, as well as those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research guidelines, because they belong to the NHMRC's national statement. Um, there is wording about evaluation in those, and my understanding, others will um, probably have that clarity, is um, if, a, if something like research is for the development of program quality, it may not need clearance by an ethics committee. Um, but in New South Wales, if it's about health and it's about um, program delivery, it is protocol for us to get clearance by the Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council's Human Research Ethics Committee. Mm -hmm. I just think it makes for better research and evaluation. Well, I guess another dimension to that is that also, um, you know, encouraging people to, punt, to publish evaluation findings. And so going through the ethics process means that you've got structures in place to support that and making the findings more accessible and distributable and accountable too. Now, Meg, I've just noticed you've got another little gem you, in every medium, adding in generous little tips. So the other one is about um, alerting people to cultural isolation. You're kind of talking about getting more than one Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people involved in the processes, not just one person. I think that's a really critical and important reflection. Yeah, that's right. I got invited. Um, you know, me, I think it sounded awesome to be invited onto a university senate committee a curriculum review <laughs> on um, implementation of the child sexual abuse royal, royal commission and um got you know got invited onto that but to me that's horrendous and no questions asked about what my relationship might be to any of the anything and um and so asked I had to ask as well can I invite someone else onto it because it's a senate committee you know you can't just bring people in and out so even that process was a bit brutal as well of me having to kind of ask can I too and um but anyway we got another Wiradjuri Williams on the committee so <laughs> got a lot of non-verbals between us <laughs> and we are actually using Nabinya in that and um and it's a fantastic experience, so it can turn out well. That's wonderful. Megan, thank you so much for your um, reflections, your generosity. Um, there's really stimulating questions, um, you know, that, that kind of point you're making about how to get the right data, how to talk to the right people, how to ask the right questions in the right way. It's just so valuable. I think there's a lot for us to go away and digest and think through um, on the committee, but others more generally. There's so much, so many people in the chat passing on their, um, their gratitude, thanking you for your poetry, which is extraordinary. I really do think you should publish it. Um, fabulous. But we have recorded this, um, this session, and one of the reasons is Megan asked in the interest of you know sharing information and using it as a teaching tool in the future um, which I think is another sign of your um, generosity so thanks again um, really appreciated Meg's got her Twitter handle here too you can follow on you do some great tweeting about issues about public health and prisoner health but also policy and evaluation questions which um, I think uh, make pretty fascinating reading um, yeah, lots of um, fantastic um, comments and gratitude here for you. Um, but yeah, we really appreciate it. You've also got something, um, the naming game. Did you want to just, yeah, is that something in the credit, but also to sum up, Meg, anything, oh, yeah, any awesome. final messages for everyone? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm used to doing group facilitation where we'll go around and talk about our relationship to Aboriginal Australia. And we've also, um, teams I've worked in have had like a, uh, 10 point, um, you know, choose your own adventure on getting to know Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. And so we've actually just flipped that with some prompts um, for us to fill in the rest of the sentence. My favourite um, local food and smell and taste is. 
And so all of this is about that um, closeness and confidence that we can have with our local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and, um, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia, you know, so that we can be good partners in evaluation and where we can understand what those ethics requirements are for us and we can advocate for doing better um, in the future. Yeah, so thanks so much for having me on and, yeah, I can tell I can talk for a living. And, That's wonderful. <laughs> um, really appreciate, yeah, the work of many people who've um, supported me and come before me. So, yeah, truly grateful. Thanks.